So to recap the setting of this series of talks, we've been uh, analyzing this framework, which Johnny uh, described earlier, uh, where we are considering different sets of assumptions that we can use to identify some low dimensional latent Z when we're observing high dimensional unstructured X. And these assumptions we've kind of split into two categories, assumptions on the distribution of Z and assumptions on our generator function G. Uh, so last week, there was a talk uh, by Gemma where the set of assumptions were mostly constrained to G. And in particular, we had this sparse dependency between Z and G um, and just fairly mild assumptions on the distribution of Z, just that they were Gaussian. Before that, we had a set of talks which were all kind of in the setting of multiple interventions being observed on Z. Uh, and in particular, we had this assumption uh, with kind of trade-offs in the number of interventions you observe, whether you could get some unconstrained G uh, from Guten's talk with the additional assumption of a linear structural causal model, or with a polynomial G, you could have dropped that linear assumption um, by Njiaki Zhang's talk. Today, we're going to be returning to the realm of interventions. It's done slightly differently here, and there's also a sparsity aspect to this as well. So now we assume that we have paired observations that are atomic, meaning there's exactly one uh, element of Z that's been perturbed in between these pairs. And in exchange for this pairing, what we get to do is we get to, in comparison to Gutem's work, drop the linear SCM assumption, and instead we have a diffeomorphic SCM. And in comparison to uh, Jackie Zhang's, we no longer have this polynomial G, it's a diffeomorphic G, although in, in uh, experimentation they relax this diffeomorphic G assumption as well further. Um, so with that, I'm happy to uh, pass it on to, to Johan. Now, let me. Thanks a lot um, for this great introduction. You should be seeing my screen. Is that working? OK, great. Yes, thanks a lot for having me to this uh, really cool seminar series. Um, I'm very happy to present our work from uh, yeah, ancient ages ago, um, NeurIPS 22, um, called Weekly Supervised Causal Representation Learning. This is work with uh, my colleague Pim Dahan, who is also shared first author of this paper, Philip Lippe and uh, Taku Cohen. Um, and I want to say one thing before I get started, that is just please talk over me uh, when you have a question, because I do not see the Zoom window while I'm presenting here. Um, yes. Yeah, short introduction. When you see a scene like this, you're probably not parsing this in terms of all the different pixels of this video feed, all the RGB values that the pixels take on, and the statistical correlations between the different um, pixel values. But I'm pretty sure that you're interpreting this directly in terms of a lower number of high level objects, like um, a robotic finger interacting with a bunch of um, buttons that light up on a table, and also in terms of the causal structure between these. Um, high level objects like the robotic fingers probably causing these um, lights to go on by touching the buttons. Um, now, in that you're very different from how most machine learning systems out there these days um, reason about data. And machine learning systems are generally stuck at this level of um, yeah, low level data representations like pixels and statistical descriptions of the data description. Um, now, this talk is like the five others in the series before it about causal representation learning. And I will uh, explain, well, I will very briefly recap this, this question once more and, and position this work within these other works. And I hope I will not bore you after you've heard so much about this already. And uh, the point that we are making is uh, like Elliot already uh, sketched, that indeed you can learn causal representations with minimal assumptions, but still assumptions on the model if your data uh, consists of paired pairs of data that observe a system before and after interventions or uh, counterfactuals. And I also have a little bit to say on operationalizing this identifiability result. I will talk about um, what we call implicit latent causal models, and I'll explain what that means and show you how this allows us to identify the causal structure and the causal variables in uh, some image data sets. Good. Let me very briefly recap the problem setting that we're interested in, a causal representation learning from uh, low level observations. Um, I think if you're on the seminar series, you're probably quite familiar with um, this, but one problem that people have been interested for many years is that of causal discovery inference, which is given a data set in terms of some causal variables, can we learn the causal structure? 
But in parallel, other people were interested in the question, if we have data in terms of some low level representations without uh, a lot of structure, like, like pixels of images, um, how can we learn an encoder to a smaller number of high level variables um, that meaningfully describe the independent concepts in the scene? Um, for instance, the positions or the states of different objects that we record with the camera. And the way that people used to make this tractable is usually by assuming statistical independence of these high level variables with some success. But this is a pretty poor approximation for most systems, if you know. And one classic example is if you think of the existence of a fork and the existence of a knife as two interesting concepts when we talk about pictures of tables, then they are clearly not statistically independent. Um, and yeah, the culmination of these two questions is this phrasing of causal representation learning, given access to a data set of uh, data at a low level representations like pixels, can we learn an encoder to high level variables as well as the relational structure and with that here in the seminar series, I think we so far at least mean the causal structure between these variables all at once. Um, maybe a few words on why you should care about this. I think there's generally three reasons that makes pe make people excited about causal representation learning. The first is that causal structure may just be of scientific interest in itself. Fair enough. The second is that people have argued that causal representations provide useful abstractions, for instance, for planning purposes, both on the level of going from a large number of low level variables like pixels to a smaller number of high level variables like object positions, but maybe also in terms of going from fine grained temporal steps in, in time sequence data or in, in MDP or something like that to um, a more coarse concept of um, temporal effects in the form of causal mechanisms. And then finally, uh, people postulate that causal models that describe a system in terms of uh, high-level variables that have independent mechanisms that determine these high-level variables may be more robust to changes of, for instance, going from one environment to another. The classic example is the sim to real transfer here, um, with the idea being that um, maybe mechanisms just change sparsely when going from one set of settings to another. Maybe slightly controversially for this crowd, I think, as far as I know, none of these benefits have really clearly been demonstrated on any real world problems. Um, and I think that's a very interesting question. And we should be thinking about this. Is causal representation learning actually practically useful for problems? But in this talk, I will not talk about that at all. I will just assume that we are interested in this and talk about how we can get there and um, uh, leave it to somebody else to figure out what to do with causal representations. Now. Um, again, preaching to the choir, but I think there's uh, two concepts that we should briefly go through, the, the formalism of causality and the concept of the identifiability. Um, and then I briefly want to recap what, what Elliot said in different words and position this work in terms of um, other works on identifiability. Um, now, causality, uh, you can think about on two different layers. There's a semantic layer to causality, which basically says that uh, we describe random variables, not just as, as a set of variables, but also um, add a relational structure to it of, of cause and effect relation. And what that functionally means is um, that causal models are meta probability distribution. They don't just give us one probability, one joint probability distribution over random variables, but also um, tell us how these probability distributions change under changing conditions. Causality is a language of change. For instance, if we have a system of the variable of, uh, you know, the, the hours that the sun is shining on a day and the amount of ice cream consumed in a place, then um, the causal model allows us to answer this question like, what if we perform an experiment and uh, force somebody to eat a lot of ice cream? Is then the sun more likely to come out uh, on that day? Yeah. Um, the formalism that I will use as a for causal models in this work is that of structural causal models. I will not really explain this in detail. I assume that you're all familiar with this. If you have questions, this, please uh, stop me right now. But the basic idea is that you describe um, how causal variables are set through causal mechanisms that depend on some noise variables, so exogenous variables, um, and some causal parents in an acyclic graph. And one concept that I'll come back to at the end of the talk again is that of the solution function, um, which is basically the summary of all the mechanisms, if you want, the, the one map that takes all the noise variables, all the exogenous variables, and maps it to all the causal variables. And um, if you know the solution function, you can compute the observational distribution of causal variables by just taking the base distribution of the exogenous variables and pushing it through the solution function. Um, uh, that's nice and simple. 
yeah, and then of course, causal models allow us to reason about interventions. So um, replacing one mechanism with another mechanism, given that we have a new mechanism, we get a new solution function, and then we can also compute a new distribution of the causal variables that we can then call the intervention distribution. Okay, stop me if you have questions on this. It's also not super important if you're not familiar with this, I think. Now, the concept of identifiability is um, as follows, some, some data setting, um, some data variable in some representation and a model class are identifiable, identifiable if the following property holds. If the data distribution um, under one model is the same as the data distribution under a second model, then these two models need to be the same or at least equal up to some equivalence relation. Um, this statement depends on a couple of things. The first is the model class. The second is the data regime that we're talking about. So are we talking about um, causal variables or low-level variables like pixels? Are we talking about observational data, or interventional data, and so on? And the third thing that this um, property identifiability depends on is the equivalence relation that we're talking about. So for instance, we could be making claims about the two models are related up to permutations of the causal variables. Um, intuitively, I think what this really means is that we can really we can identify the ground truth causal structure of nature of the data generating process just by fitting a model. There's some fine print here, and the fine print is important, but I will just skip over it right now. Um, now, of course, we were by far not the first to think about and identifiability in, in this work. And people have been wondering under which circumstances can you really can you identify the high level variables just by fitting models? Um, to the data that you can observe for some time. And I'd like to quickly draw a map of this where on the x-axis, I'm not sure I have a zoom window in front of this. Let's see if I can move this out of the way. Yeah. Um, on the x-axis, you have some um, assumptions on your model family. On the y-axis, you have some assumptions on your data regime. Um, and on both of these, you can make more strict assumptions or more lenient assumptions as uh, Elliot already uh, recapped in the introduction. Um, and there has been a lot of work going back to around the year 2000 with uh, Apo Hivarin's work on, on linear ICA that identified different settings um, on the data and on the model class that allowed you to really identify the um, high level variables that describe the systems from low level data, I think pixels. Um, but at the same time, people also figured out that not every setting is identifiable, right? And there have been some some quite influential uh, works that showed that in if you don't have strict enough assumptions on the data or if you don't have strong enough assumptions on your model class, that it's impossible to identify anything about your high-level representations or you get such a large equivalence class that, that the insight is kind of useless. And together, this, this huge body of work kind of divides the space of data settings and model settings into some regions. There's the, the region of identifiability, and the settings where we can really identify the concepts, the meaningful high-level variables from data by fitting a model, and the region where that is kind of theoretically fundamentally impossible. But these two regions that we, we are kind of understanding now don't neatly map up. There's a, a huge range of settings on data modalities and on model assumptions where we don't know yet whether they are identifiable or whether they're not identifiable. And our work here uh, two years ago um, pushed the frontier of what is identifiable a little bit further um, into this, this unknown uh, region here. Um, on the end of having reasonably weak assumptions on the model, I think, I like to think at least, but buying this with some um, form of supervision that I will talk more about that is not always available in real world applications. Now we are, of course, this was two years ago. We were not the last one to study this problem. And I think you've seen uh, some talks in this series already that, that uh, came after our work here. And there's been some really, great work on kind of pushing this frontier in the direction of relaxing the model assumptions further, going from this paired data setting that we are considering that I'll explain in a second to um, um, more unpaired data, multi-environment settings or interventional data, um, and buying this generally with slightly stronger assumptions in the, uh, on the model direction. Now, okay, that's, that's a big landscape. I've talked a lot, but not about our work really so far. So, um, yeah, okay, maybe let me summarize this, this very briefly. If you squint a little bit, this map um, tells you three things, I think. The first is that um, learning high-level variables and causal structure from IID data, if you don't make really strong assumptions on your model that make it kind of irrelevant for many practical problems, that's impossible. But if you go to non-IID data, data that includes changes like 
multi-environment settings or like these paired settings that, that we are considering, then there's now a lot of work that shows that it is indeed theoretically and experimentally possible. And in a slightly cheesy summary, causality is maybe the language of change and change lets us identify causal structure. And that's kind of nice. Now, okay. Um, let me become a little bit more concrete and talk about what we show in this paper. Um, we um, provide a new identifiability result for causal representations from what we call weak supervision, but what is, yeah, it's, it's kind of a, it's, it's not as strong as explicit labels, but it's also not super weak. Um, and the key concept in our theory result is that of a latent causal model. Um, this is, I think, quite closely related to some other forms of latent causal structure that you've discussed already. Uh, so I, I'll be quick here, but we start by defining a latent causal model as a set of high-level variables, causal variables, if you wish, that have a SCM between them, together with a decoder or rendering functions to some data space like uh, pixels. Um, we, because our um, high-level variables are described by a structural causal model, we can reason about how they behave under interventions. So we can, for instance, say, what happens if we change um, the mechanism for one of these, these particles? What happens if we flip over a domino, so to speak? And we can push forward the, the before and after state, uh, before and after this intervention, um, fixing all the exogenous variables through the decoder to pixel space. So we can observe the effect of an intervention in data space. This gives us a pair of a representation of a scene um, before an intervention and after intervention, again, assuming that the noise variables stay the same. Um, and this is kind of the, the, the process that we are considering in this work. Um, we assume that there's some ground truth latent causal model that consists again of high level causal variables and the decoder function that represents the data generating process or nature. Um, and But we only observe data at this before after paired way at the level of pixels. Um, we do not assume any labels uh, that tell us about the values of the causal variables, that tell us about which variable was intervened on, or that tell us anything else here. But this assumption that the noise variables don't change is a quite strong one. And um, this is in Perl's causal language, uh, what, what he calls counterfactuals. And I think when we started this work, we were kind of hoping this is a useful causal abstraction of time series data. You know, some things change, and then you observe um, kind of the the causal effects trickling down and how the system changes under that. But it's been not so easy to find real world systems that really fall into this paradigm. And maybe that's something to be discussed later. Um, but if we just run with this assumption, if we assume we can observe a system before and after an intervention without labels on the low level, and if we assume that the noise variables stay fixed, then we can um, study what happens uh, when we fit a model to this data. So we have a neural version of this latent causal model. How we implement this, we, we can talk about in a second, but let's for now I'll just say this is a fully expressive representation of your LCM. We train this using uh, the best optimizer we ever have on infinite data. And we prove then that in these settings and under some assumptions, um, a neural latent causal model that perfectly fits the weakly supervised data um, necessarily has the same causal variables and the same causal structure as the ground truth, as the process that generated the data, up to some equivalence class. And our equivalence class consists of permutations of the causal variables and um, independent element-wise transformation of each causal variable. And so I think this is a, a so there are some strong assumptions go into this, but this is a pretty strong statement. Um, if we fit these paired data of before and after states, uh, kind of almost independent of, of, of what the process is up to the assumptions that we can discuss in a second. Again, um, we can really identify not just the causal variables, but also the, the, the entire causal graph, all the mechanisms and everything up to some not so important green labels. Now, strong statements need uh, strong ingredients. Um, let me quickly skip over the proof sketch here because I think, um, yeah, it's, it, it's not really uh, something I want to, to cover, but if you have questions, we can uh, look at that afterwards. Um, the assumptions that go into this, um, the first one is, of course, that we have availability of this counterfactual or weakly supervised data of these pairs of before and after states of the system. Um, that's a strong assumption. And you can imagine some systems where, where that is possible. But the, this assumption of the noise being um, the same in before and after 
and nothing else changing in the scene is really quite restrictive. And um, we've, yeah, many people thankfully have thought about relaxing this to, to more practical settings. And uh, some people here in the audience, I think, have uh, done some great work on that. Um, you can relax this to unpaired settings, but there's no free lunch. You, you need to buy that with some, some other um, uh, assumptions for on the model side. The second assumption we're making is that causal variables are single real numbers. And um, it was surprisingly hard to relax this to higher dimensional causal variables. Um, we, we had some ideas that it could be possible to relax this, for instance, if you assume um, external symmetries and knowledge of these external symmetries in a system. For instance, if you talk about geometric data, maybe you have some rotation symmetry um, between the whole scene or something like this. Um, but we never really worked this out entirely. We just had some some initial examples on this that made us optimistic about this possibility. But yeah, no final answer, unfortunately. Um, another assumption that we're making here is that the causal mechanisms are diffeomorphic maps. Um, if you fix the causal parents, each mechanism is a diffeomorphic map of the noise variable to the causal variable. That's restrictive. And in some sense, this kind of breaks the difference between counterfactuals and 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 interventions uh it's yeah and it's, it's really difficult to relax this assumption in our setting and still get identifiability at least we weren't able to figure it out then um we assume that all the causal variables somehow affect the uh, data and, and yeah the the decoder is injective there's no hidden confounder so to speak no variables that don't affect the low level data at all we assume that the decoder is deterministic. This is actually something we believe could be quite easy to relax, um, similar to the IVAE paper. And then uh, that interventions are perfect and uh, complete. So all single target interventions are somewhere in the data set. Even though we don't have labels, we need to know that they all have that somewhere. Though we do believe that it's possible to relax our result to um, interventions on multiple targets. But then you need some kind of overlap criteria on these targets. And otherwise, you just have partial identifiability of the causal system. Anyway, so strong statement, but it also requires um, strong ingredients, sadly. Now, um, are there any questions straight away on this theoretic part? Because otherwise I'd storm ahead and talk about how we implement this in practice. I uh, will go on then. So um, the this theoretic identifiability result is maybe the most important um, thing back then in our paper, but I think we also have one thing that I found quite interesting to share in the um, implementation of, of making this result practical. And to say this in a slightly, um, yeah, I don't know, in, in one way, it's just this, this, this wisdom of implicit is better than explicit. And um, what I mean with implicit and explicit is the way that we represent causal structure. Um, so the explicit representation of causal structure to me is through causal mechanisms and the graph between the causal variables. All right, so this is, if you remember this equation, we, we set causal variables through a mechanism that depends on the parents according to some causal graph and the functional form of the mechanisms as well as the causal graph, which determines the functional signature here is um, really the, the parameterization of, of the causal structure in this, this explicit uh, way of looking at it. But there's an equivalent under our assumptions way of representing causal structures, structures through the solution function. Remember the solution function is this map from the set of all the exogenous or noise variables to the set of all the causal variables. And you can always get the solution function by successively applying causal mechanisms in uh, uh, the topological order of the causal graph. Um, what's a little bit less obvious is that under the assumptions that we have in this work, in particular under this diffeomorphic assumption on the map from noise variables to causal variables, um, the other way also works. We can always uniquely determine the causal mechanisms and the causal graph from each valid solution function. Um, so these are just two different ways of parameterizing the causal structure, either by giving this, this whole solution function that maps noise variables to the causal variables or by listing all the uh, causal mechanisms in the causal graph. Now, how do we use this in practice? When we operationalize this, this identifiability result, we, like many other people, start with the concept of a VAE. We um, built an encoder from low level space to some latent space. We have a decoder back to the, the data space. And we put a prior on the latent space that somehow encodes the causal structure on the high level variables. And the explicit version of this identifies 
the latent variables with the causal variables of the system. This is the most obvious thing you can do. It totally makes sense. And then we can write down a prior here that um, depends on a neural representation of a causal graph, for instance, uh, using some Gumbel softmax representation of edge existence uh, to make the, the graph differentiable, um, or some representation um, that kind of disentangles the edge direction and uh, edge existence. And there's a few different ones of these, and we've tried a few different ones. Um, and yeah, then also there's a representation of causal mechanisms here, right? We really have functions somewhere that compute the value of causal variables as a function of the parents and the noise variables. Um, yeah, this is very straightforward. And this is the first thing we, we started out with. And it works, kind of. But it's really, for us, it was really tricky to get this work reliably in systems with many variables, with more complex graphs, and so on. And of course, it's possible that we just suck at optimization, that we're not really good at, at finding the right uh, uh, differential graph parameterizations. Uh, maybe we, we just didn't tune our hyperparameters enough. That's, I can't refute that. But I think we have a different theory for this. And that's. Um, there's a bit of a chicken and egg problem here. Um, we found that when we fix the um, representations, when we kind of cheat and give our model the causal variables, when we initialize them to the ground truth variables, it will very quickly learn the correct causal graph and the mechanisms. Um, similarly, when we know the graph, when we give the model the graph already, or initialize it such that the graph is equal to the ground truth, it will very quickly learn the correct causal uh, variables. But learning both jointly at the same time from scratch um, was very difficult in practice. Typically, we'd start a couple of different random seeds, and some of them would find the global optimum also with the lowest loss. Some of them would not. And looking at these runs that did not give us the, the global optimum, we found some evidence for local minima here. And we could also kind of analyze it a little bit and find that um, these not successful runs typically had the correct graph skeleton, but wrongly oriented edges. And um, then kind of almost correct causal variables. And it's it's really hard to escape such a configuration because you kind of need to go um, to much worse configurations first before you can kind of arrive at the global optimum with a different causal graph. So the the restriction for the model of always describing a correct, syntactically correct uh, model with a valid graph is makes learning really hard. It really gives you local minima. Thankfully, we had a different idea um, that avoids this, this hard problem of learning explicit graph representations because you don't have to. And that's what we call implicit latent causal models. Here again, we start with the VAE approach and we identify the latent variables now with the noise variables in an SCM, uh, so the exogenous variables. And we add a learnable uh, map from the noise variables to another vector space, the causal variables um, that we identify with the solution function. Um, but in this solution function, because the solution function is just a map from n real numbers to n real numbers, we do not have to explicitly parameterize edges. We don't explicitly have to parameterize the graph structure here. And um, it turns out when you actually write down the, the uh, elbow for this VAE, you never have to really rely on some explicit graph representations. You can just write down the loss as is, and the training is then much smoother. And we found that this much more reliably, kind of for every random seed, every initialization just works. And it works nicely. So what can you do after you've trained such a model? I'll show you some, some practical results in a second. But just in principle, um, given a trained implicit latent causal model, of course, you can use your, your decoder, uh, sorry, your encoder to map pixels to causal variables. You can also um, uh, find the causal graph. I know I just told you that there's no explicit graph representations. But you can either take the um, causal variables that you learned and use an off-the-shelf causal discovery algorithm. We did that with ENCO. Um, by uh, Philip Lippe and others, or, or we also have a heuristic algorithm that just analyzes the solution function and uh, finds the causal structure implicitly encoded in that. Both of these worked kind of equally well and quite reliable. Uh, yeah, you can also, given a before and after data pair, you can infer what kind of intervention happened. And finally, this is a generative model as a VAE, and you can use it to generate observational, interventional, or counterfactual data um, anywhere you like. Now, that's our experimental setup. I want to spend a few minutes on talking about um, how we tested that in practice. Um, we, for this paper, we ran a couple of different. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, Johan. Yes. Can I ask a question before we go on to the experiments? Yeah. Um, 
Can you go back to where you mentioned that you can infer from pairs of data uh, in interventions? Yes. Yeah, I, I was just curious. So more specifically, how do you do this in your I I ILCM framework? Yeah. Right, so um, I, I didn't show this because this is, uh, yeah, I don't know, it's, it's a bit of a technical issue, but we actually, um, in our VAE setup, we consider the intervention target as a latent variable as well. So we have an explicit encoder that given the before and after state uh, infers the, gives us a probability distribution over which variables the intervention uh, acted on. We focus on this case of single target interventions, but you could also extend this to a multi-target intervention. I don't think there's any fundamental problem. Um, and then does this intervention latent variable also feature as an ingredient to the decoding function when you try to decode your pixels again? Um, no, I think not. I think we, no, the, the decoder is really just um, kind of given the, the, in this case, noise variables, it just maps to uh, the pixel space. Okay. Um, yeah. But I also if, we, if we want to, sorry, just uh, in practice, of course, we decode both the before and the after image for these data pairs. And for the uh, after image, kind of indirectly, the, the intervention encoder plays a role because it kind of we construct the, the latent variables post intervention using the uh, inferred intervention target there. Um, I could flash you like a diagram of this whole process very quickly. This uh, maybe spoil a few things, but that's fine. Okay. So this is uh, kind of the whole, um, yeah, this is, I think, the, the process that, that matters. So kind of, um, you see here, uh, we, we kind of um, reconstruct the noise variables before and after the uh, intervention here. And um, um, uh, let's give me one second. Basically then the decoder is just applied to the before and after state to give us the reconstructions. Okay. Yeah. Actually, I don't really want to get into too much detail here. So there was another question. Yeah, um, and I think it's related. Um... I'm trying to think about this implicit way of learning the models. And you have here, you know, like a color of like what noise variable changed. And like, obviously that can change many of the causal variables, um, anything that's downstream of the one that was uh, intervened on. Yeah. And I'm just wondering, cause I would think in like a kind of general framework with like soft interventions or mechanism changes, you would possibly have issues with the fact that like sparsity in the number of variables that are intervened on doesn't translate to sparsity on the solution function. Um, yes. So That's I'm interesting. Be worried if like this kind of parameterization would just make it harder to say, you know, how many variables were intervened on um in kind of the setting with multiple node interventions yeah. and soft or soft interventions mechanism changes yeah i guess there's kind of two different directions you can think about here right there's the multi-target perfect interventions and there's going from perfect interventions to 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 soft interventions um or imperfect or yeah and kind of the multi-target thing i'm not so worried about i think um um as long as you still have kind of some form of sparsity, right? You don't always intervene on all the variables. I think then you're lost. But if you still have like some some kind of mm -hmm. criterion on sparsity there, I, I think you can still um, get uh, the same result essentially. Just need mm -hmm. to make sure that your your intervention target sets are sufficiently, you know, uh, overlapping in the right ways. Yeah, but going from perfect to to soft intervention, that's a really good question, and I do not know the answer to that off the top of my head. I, I definitely our result won't directly work. Um, yeah, I guess it depends a little bit on how much, like, do you, do you want to, I mean, you still have to put some knowledge on things changing on your uh, post-intervention mechanisms, right? You can't just allow them to stay the same, for instance, then you certainly won't get identifiability. So, and, and probably you, you will want some form of sparsity on it as well, I guess. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it really depends on the assumption on the post-intervention mechanisms then. Um, Okay, so like something uh, to think more yeah. about, not already, yeah, known how to translate. Yeah, no, that cool. yeah, it's a great question, and I don't know the answer. Thank you. I I kind of stopped thinking about the setting a little bit because I to to be perfectly transparent Got about a lot this. Of I, other cool stuff to do. 
Well, also that, but no, no, but I wanted to say is that I lost the belief that this interventional setting is really a useful practical abstraction of, of real world systems in it. Uh, we, we struggled so hard with finding real world examples for this that uh, I, yeah, I don't know. I didn't want to keep working on this. So I'm, I'm, I'm not a very good salesman here for this. I still think there's, there's an interesting insight here, but it's quite unclear how practically relevant it is. No, I haven't thought about the implicit way of doing this. I think I need to think about it more because uh, yeah, obviously so one thing in your framework. So yeah, one thing that is kind of nice about this is maybe that's not it's less important, but you could also apply this implicit way of thinking to, for instance, just causal discovery. And I think I've seen a post that clear on this at some point, but I yeah, I totally forgot. I think my Johnny name. is doing something. Ah, cool. Yeah. 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 Though then the the. This kind of total equivalence of explicit and implicit representations requires some assumptions, like in our case, this diffeomorphism assumptions. But I think that can also be relaxed, and then you get maybe, uh, yeah, something slightly different. Good. Are there more questions on this um, um, operationalizing part? Otherwise, I'll show you what what we did with this. Um, so we, we ran experiments, and I think we can characterize them along the, the dimensionality of the low-level space and the complexity of the uh, high-level space a little bit. We started with just some toy examples. That's not so interesting. I'll not talk about it. We also did some causal 3D identity. So, ident so if you like uh, floating bunnies in a spotlight, um, we could talk about that as well. But we weren't. So this was two years ago. And back then, we, we felt like the, the causal representation learning benchmarks weren't maybe not so great yet. I think that changed quite a bit since then. So we also cooked up our own. We um, contributed a new data set that we call causal circuit and uh, also did uh, one uh, toy data, but scaling experiment to, to larger causal systems and data dimensionalities here. Yeah. And I just want to focus on the causal circuit thing that we introduced and the scaling experiment. Um, yeah, so this causal circuit thing is a new data set um, where we, we try to be a bit more intuitive with our causal structure than what, what we and others were doing with a causal 3D ident. So um, this is a simple model of a causal system involving a robotic arm. This is the video I showed you in the beginning. There's a couple of touch sensitive lights connected with some circuits. In our case, if you touch the green light, not just the green light will go on, but also the red light. And um, to match our assumptions in the theory sections, we had to um do some things that are maybe not super intuitive for instance the um the lights are continuous variables here it's not just a binary on or off thing but they can be um uh, yeah light like like uh, light up more or less um and kind of where the robot arm touches the the button determines that i could alternatively say how much it touches the button but yeah something like this it's like a you know like these lights you can at home that you can dim uh, our train on so that's that's a bit um not super realistic, maybe. And yes, then we, we trained our model and some, some baselines that we uh, cooked up on these paired pre and post intervention data sets here. But just on pixel levels, we used, um, we rendered this with Mujoko and used um, 512 squared um, sized images for this. If you're interested, this data set is also um, public. Now, OK, what, what did we find? Uh, first of all, the classic disentanglement question. Here you, um, I show you. Uh, a, a state rendered by our model, and then I vary one latent variable at a time and show you how the output image changes just to visualize what the learned latent variables mean. And we find that if we vary the first latent variable uh, in the corresponding image, only the, the robot arm position changes, right? Not Nothing about the, the lights. If you vary the second um, uh, causal variable, it's just one of the light states that, that turns on. The third one corresponds to the, the another light and the, the fourth one to yet another light. And yeah, this, this is something we could not achieve with any of the baselines based on, for instance, uh, just the beta BAE. Um, the causal variables that we have are in a very clear one-to-one -one relation with the true high-level concepts in this scene. Um, now, the, the graph that we can extract from our method also matches the true causal graph. So the, the true causal graph is the robot arm causing the state of the three lights. And then there's this circuit between the lights. What we find is exactly the same thing, or and there's some some reordering of these parameters. So I shouldn't say the graphs are the same. They are isomorphic to each other under permutations of causal variables. Um, and then finally, because we have this generative model, and because the latent space is a representation of causal structure, we can 
predict things like uh, what happens if we intervene on latent variables. What I now show you is kind of a hallucination, if you wish, of our causal model, where we just take one state and then intervene on a single latent variable and uh, observe what that corresponds to after we push it through the, the learned decoder. And here we kind of perform an intervention on the position of the robot arm. And you can see that when we when it goes over, when it touches the um, the uh, the buttons, the, the lights go on, and it also correctly learned that the, the blue and green light are causal parents of the red light because of this arbitrary structure that we imposed in our data set. So that all worked quite nicely. But again, we, we had to make sure that the assumptions we put in um, into our uh, theory also were, were satisfied in this experiment. One last result I wanted to show is um, the scalability of this. And here with scalability, I just mean the number of causal variables. And uh, I yeah. think we, yeah. Mm -hmm. Question on that. Can you do, presumably you can't do like interventions where you break that dependence between green and red lights. So ah, like, uh, do the same thing, but, but like fix the light to be one color, say, you know. I mean, so yes, you can. You can you could perform an intervention on the, the the red variable, kind of replacing the mechanism for the red light yeah. uh, to you know be independent of the others. Um, yeah. That totally works. I don't have a. I think I have a video for that, but not in this uh, slide deck. But the thing is, because we only trained this with single target interventions. Actually, no. Sorry, I think there's also no problem at all to doing a multi target intervention. So you could kind of replace the red light. Um, uh, mechanism and uh, the position of the robot arm and observe what happens with both together. Yeah, that, that should work. I'm not sure why I never visualized that. It's a, it's a good idea. Like we didn't have these kind of two target interventions during training, but because you have the full latent SCM, there's nothing keeping you from doing this post hoc. Yeah, I mean, it's sort of interesting because, because that then takes you out of distribution with respect to, you know, you never see examples of the robot arm touching the green light without the red light, the green, thing without the red light? Um, not, that's not entirely true, right? Because you could have a pair in the training data where uh, actually the process, like the training data has interventions on these life states. It's not just interventions on the robot arm, right? So there could be uh, a pair in there where um, there's an intervention be between the pre and post state, there happens an intervention on the, the red light. And uh -huh. co incidentally, the position of the robot arm is already in the position that we would uh, you know, intervene it to. Um, I see. I see. Okay. So I think there, there's some support there. I'm not sure, like, if you make it more complex, probably at some point. Yeah, I need to think this uh, through a bit, but I, I, I feel like because we really, we have an SCM and we, it's kind of provably uh, isomorphic to the true SCM and we have a decoder that shouldn't really care about these things because we, uh, yeah, we also assume that all our distributions, like the noise distributions have full support uh, over, over some, some subset of R. So there's, there, there can't really be a full OD situation on the level of, you know, just the pre or the post state um, as for our assumptions. Whether these assumptions right. are realistic is a different question, but in principle, it, like, as long as you satisfy them, it should work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. And here's our, our scaling results. So this is a super toy experiment, not unheard of in the causality field, perhaps, where we just take a bunch of uh, causal variables. They have the Gaussian, uh, random variables, we, uh, for simplicity, to just not run into stupid initializations of neural networks, we, we decided to just have a linear um, causal model here and a linear decoder that we restricted to SON in this case, something from the harm measure. But we also briefly checked, we can also do something like initialize uh, neural networks randomly and use that. Then you just have to be very careful to not get crazy settings. Um, yeah, and but in this simple setting, we found kind of robust disentanglement up to 10 causal variables without doing any hyperparameter tuning. Um, of course, it's a quite simple setting. So uh, I, I don't want to make predictions of how well this would scale if we have much more complicated uh, causal models and decoders. Um, that's, that's an unanswered question in our work. Good, and now um, this is where I maybe alienate some part of the audience. And uh, I want to be very careful. I will say some critical things of our own work. And I only mean this uh, about our own work. And I think a lot of people have already started addressing these kind of self-criticisms. Uh, so this is not a criticism of the field as a whole. But I think right now, or actually where we were two years ago, there were a lot of things that made this work um, not practically useful. Um, so identifiability theory is nice. 
and it's fun to think about. But um, I think what we should really have at some point uh, is the demonstration of the usefulness on downstream tasks. That's that's really the thing that that shows that that these things matter. Um, this is very much a criticism of our own work. This this interventional or uh, sorry counterfactual or paired uh, pre and post intervention data set is very hard to to match to real world problems. And I'm glad that other people have started working on more realistic data regimes, including some of you. Um, for instance, working on observational data with strong model assumptions, interventional data with less strong model assumptions. I think it would be really cool ultimately if we make it to videos. Um, but yes, there, there's a lot of stuff happening in this space and that's great. Another thing that I've seen less work on is for now, we assume that interventions are external to the system. They're just handed to us by uh, some, some mechanism. We know nothing about it. And that's fine for some um, systems, maybe examples in biology, for instance. But um, in, for instance, autonomous driving or robotics, we can also imagine to include the, the mechanism that, that performs the intervention in the system that we model or something like learning uh, how to perform interventions. I think that that is a fun question as well. Right. In most of the works I've seen on causal representation learning, the causal variables are kind of fixed. They always have the same meaning. And there's a fixed number. Um, of course, the real world is not like that. And we should strive to move towards variable scene composition. Um, yeah, I don't actually believe in DAGs. I, I feel like useful causal abstractions are often not acyclic. And um, unless we kind of unroll over time, but then they become so complex that uh, that, that graph is not really a useful abstraction anymore. So it would be great to study representation learning with weaker relational structures, maybe some, some something in between object-centric learning without relational structure and causal representation learning with this very strict DAG-based uh, relational structure. And then finally, of course, the experiments are, uh, at least in our work, are very toy, maybe in some other works as well. And uh, yeah, it, it, it is still a long way to really go to, to realistic um, real world problems. This is maybe slightly better in biology. That's not really my area of expertise, but um, I, I haven't seen nothing that would make a robotics person excited about causal representation, for instance. But again, mostly a self-criticism. I, I, I don't want to step on anyone's toes. And I think many people are, are doing really cool work on pushing for this to, to become more useful. And that's all I had to say today. I hope I'm not terribly much over time and I'd be very happy to uh, discuss your questions. If you find this interesting, here's just a, a reference to our paper. There's a pretty picture from my collaborators and I put a pretty random selection of other papers in this space. Very sorry if I missed yours um, on the slide as well. Um, there was just way too much cool stuff to all put it on the slide. Great. Thank you so much for a great talk. And you should have uh, gone to the causal representation learning workshop at Merips because it was full of self-criticism. Ah, <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I, I've, I've seen some Twitter posts about it, but I had, I think, two other workshops where I had papers at the same time. Um, yeah, let's go. We can at least stay on until 11 for questions. And if you want to stay on five to 10 minutes after that, um, you know, for having a good conversation, but open the floor now for questions. Um, I have a question. Um, yeah, so uh, uh, thanks for the for the great talk. Um, I was wondering if you can say a few words about um, how to uh, at least briefly about how to relax this diffeomorphism assumption. So how can you allow for situations where there are multiple observed states mapping to the same latent state? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And I wish I had a good answer to that. I think from the theory that, that we've done, um, I don't really see how you could just extend our identifiability result there. I think you need to, to add something to it, either have new insights on, on how to prove things or more likely at uh, at some structure, or I think what I would find interesting is kind of get some partial identifiability, some 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 relaxation of the equivalence class that takes this um, ambiguity you get when when multiple interventions kind of uh, map in the same way between the before and after state um, mm -hmm. that should be taken into account by the equivalence class. Um, so I think that's like if I wanted to work on that, I would I would try to well, 
I think it's very interesting. And I think one should think about is there like a nice way of relaxing an occurrence class that that takes this into account. Maybe we can define something like um, the uh, causal mechanisms are diffeomorphic up to some um, group or something like that. Though that's probably not very realistic, but but some structure and use the structure to define a, a weaker equivalence class and uh, then get a. Wait, was the was the diffeomorphism on the mixing function or the solution function? Or oh no no no! Um, for the mixing function, I. I think we also put that in the theory, but in practice, we don't have that. So I think that it's totally fine in practice if the mixing function is uh, um, like just injective. Yeah, or just, yeah, I guess in injective. Um, yeah, uh, probably just in practice, something like approximately invertible. I think that's that's I'm not so worried about that. I know it's really the the, the causal mechanisms for us. There's a diffeomorphic relation. Like if you condition on the parents causal uh, variables that are the parents, then there's the diffeomorphism between the uh, noise variable and the corresponding causal variable. And that's a strong assumption mm -hmm. because that mm -hmm. means that, um, yeah, kind of there's only one value of the noise variable that takes you, uh, that corresponds oh, so to on one the value of the causal, causal mechanisms, not yes. on the overall solution function as well. Yes, whole. no, that's, okay. that's right. And the individual causal mechanisms. Um, yeah, because I think I've seen it on the whole solution function in like, causal normalizing flows work, which is I, not I with think, representation learning, but. Yeah, I think that's equivalent, uh, at least in one direction. So you can show, and I think that's something we do somewhere in the appendix, that if the individual mechanisms are diffeomorphic, then the solution function uh, is also diffeomorphic. That direction, I it's, believe, but it might be weaker. Sure. Yeah, and the other, I'm not sure. Like you may, may need to restrict then the image or something. Um, Oh, so um, sorry, just checking if I got this right. So you're saying you you're not super worried about the mixing function being non-injective. So the mixing function mm -hmm. being like the map from the, uh, yeah. So the direction is the the map from the like the causal model, on yep. Z to the to X the observed states, right? So you're not super worried about that being non-injective. Yeah, maybe I said that too strongly. So what, what I meant is in practice, if this is kind of just approximately injective, I'm, I think that's totally fine. Like for instance, if there's kind of uh, similar but different values of causal variables that look exactly the same in pixel space, for instance, because of discretization, then that's, that's gonna be fine. I think you will not have theoretic identifiability, but in practice, it could still work uh, well. Um, but yes, I for the theory, I think you need the injectivity or like, yeah, I think that's... Uh... that's yeah, I don't know. Perhaps I'm just looking at this from a like different perspective because I feel like this injectivity is actually quite a strong assumption, right? Because you're trying to because the mixing function goes from a much lower dimensional space yeah. to a much higher dimensional space. So in in practice, um, you like I I would imagine that there is a large observational set. In, in your X space that correspond to the to a single point in the Z space, right? Um, I, well, for this to I mean, be defined in terms of a generative process, like the mixing function couldn't be deterministic. It would have to be yeah. replaced by like a stochastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I think that's also kind of what I, what I have in mind a little bit. For instance, in our practical examples, we, we often used a decoder that was actually stochastic and it still worked fine. But for the theory, we assume this deterministic property, and then you really have like a like a, a bijection between the latent space and the data space when restricted to the image of the the uh, decoder. Um, so when you do this, but in, in practice, practice, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah. So when you do this in in practice, you you use some stochastic decoder. Like, is there any noise assumption on the stochasticity? Like, for example, do you use like do you use like a deterministic decoder plus some noise? Doesn't yeah, we, we, yeah. So um, because we, we stuck to this VAE framework in some sense, there's always a stochastic decoder, right? Like, like VAE is kind of uh, described like a probability distribution over the data space uh, conditional on, on the latents and they are, they're never exactly deterministic, but uh, then in practice often become quite deterministic. Uh, and that's, that's exactly what we did. So I think, now this is, is some time ago, but what I remember is that we just had a neural network that predicts the mean and the variance for each um, pixel. Mm. Um, so 
then during training at some of the variants will be quite small, but still in principle, it's stochastic. Mm. Okay. I think uh, that's what we did, yeah. I have a follow-up question, Johan, about this, uh, mm -hmm. the AE architecture. So, I mean, if we really weren't so concerned about proving any results whatsoever, um, mm -hmm. you have your implicit latent, latent causal model, um, the AE framework, and let's say that from the pixel space, I can't back out exactly which configuration of the noise variables created this particular observation. Um, I can still go ahead and fit this VAE in some sense, right? Like uh, I would just learn from any given pixel that I have some distribution over possible values of the noise variable that yeah. could have led to that yes. observation. Yeah. Um, and in some sense, like I feel like VAEs allow us to do this anyway. When we do yeah. um, Bayesian inference and deep generative modeling, it's not like we assume that from a given X, we know exactly what value of Z um, brought us there, but we, we anyways yeah. learn a posterior. So in that sense, um, it feels like if we didn't care about the theory, then maybe we could just use your framework anyways, um, even if we don't have this diffeomorphism on the the solution function. That, that's a very interesting point. And I think in principle, you're right. Of course, there's no guarantees then. One one thing that's a little bit funny is that I think if you give up the diffeomorphism property, then you can't uniquely determine the causal mechanisms from the solution function anymore. But maybe that's fine. Maybe that gives you exactly the ambiguity that you have then. Um, yeah, I think that, that, that feels correct without being able to prove it. So actually, yeah, I, I think that's very interesting. Posteriors have then... everything, Danny. <laughs> yeah. Uh, posteriors have everything, hey, Danny. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly, right? That's exactly yeah. right. Like even over, then when we're trying to reconstruct, we can just use the posterior predictive or something. Like we can, yeah. we can integrate over some of our uncertainty there. Sorry, I'm laughing yes. because we, I did a postdoc with, with Yosha and, and, and sort of halfway through my postdoc, he got a little less excited about causal representation learning than he did th at the beginning. And he was just like, we should just be Bayesian over everything. And <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's taken us a while, but we're sort of coming around to his way of thinking. <laughs> uh, more yeah, I mean, I'm kind of curious. You, you guys are much more in sync with the community than I am. And I am I'm curious if you also have this feeling that people are a little bit less excited about causal representation learning than they were two years ago. Or is that just me? No, I feel this way. I really, really share your mm. perspective right now. Yeah, yeah. I so so I was actually that, that was going to be the question I was going to ask is 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 I I I, said, I heard the sort of in the sort of second second hand, but um, Noam Nisa and the theoretical computer scientist has um, uh, has this nice quip, which is like if you come up across a a negative result it's it's like a sign that you're asking the wrong question um so they they say <laughs> the results are useful in that they're ask they sort of signs and i feel like what's happened with this community is like we've been excited about the direction we i think the questions feel like the right questions like we want to understand how we do causal inference from unstructured data i think that is that remains a very important question yeah um but perhaps the the framework in which we're doing this we just keep coming up against negative results and maybe the framework itself is just like the wrong way of thinking about it. Um, maybe not, I don't, you know, like, I yeah. be, but, but um, I'm curious whether you like kind of, I don't think the questions go away. Like, I don't think, I don't think yeah. we, we do much, many of the sciences work. So I'm, I'm, I've become very focused on the sort of scientific applications of this. Yeah. So I'm biased in that direction. Obviously, like if you care about robotics, then maybe, Maybe like maybe you don't even like in, from a robotics ro perspective. There's an argument that like maybe we just don't care about the abstract representation. Yeah. Um, maybe we can just like find a representation that's useful for control, and that's fine. Like, um, but but I think for the scientific questions, I think we do care about what the underlying we we, we mm -hmm. want to make claims about the underlying structure of the world, and something like the questions that we're asking remain, but it's not obvious that it has to be like disentanglement and then. Um, yeah. and then like learn causal mechanisms on disentangled variables, but kind of, if not, what is in the, in, I think that's, yeah. that remains kind of open and interesting to think about. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. And like to the, the question part of your question, I, I don't have an answer to that. Unfortunately, I wish I had, 
Um, and I find this kind of the scientific mindset really the most convincing reason for doing causal representation learning now. I feel like many of these kind of like arguing through downstream benefits things um, were motivated by the idea that some things wouldn't work just, just learning from previous data. And since three years ago, the, the things that we can solve by learning from tons of data have just changed a little bit. Um, yeah, exactly. Okay. And like, yeah, exactly in robotics, for instance, if we care about like passing the scene, it's it's maybe not so interesting to do this from scratch and provably, it's much more interesting to, to say, okay, we already have so much data and a lot of it is labeled and um, uh, kind of, we, had, we can just use all this knowledge in the world to, to build efficient robotics algorithms. Why should we bother with kind of training from tabula rasa in a new environment? Yeah. yeah. It's less fun, but uh, sadly it works. <laughs> but yeah, this, for, for science, there's definitely still a case there. And yeah, I, I, I think that there will be cool stuff in representation learning. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we've had, like, I've had a lot of fun being, so I've spent the year at, um, at Recursion, which is um, a pharmaceutical company. Um, but it's been a lot of fun interacting with biologists and seeing how they deal with mm -hmm. things. They like high dimensional data all the time. They just work with it all the time. Um, and they have a lot of the same kinds of questions, but they approach problems very differently. Um, and it's been fun kind of seeing how they how they approach the problem. There's a lot of things that like they're not happy with and they don't like, and they, but they do anyway. Mm -hmm. Like TCNE is used all the time and UMAP and like they, everyone kind of knows it's wrong, but no one yeah. knows what to do about it. Um, you know, but, but nevertheless, they sort of are making progress and they're doing things and they're sort of understanding this data in their own way. And I think, I think it's kind of interesting to think about, they've got sort of similar goals of like, how do we yeah. make, scientific statements from high dimensional data. And then they have the buy-in of like, actually they, they care about the questions that they're actually trying to yeah. answer. Not yeah. just the methods, <laughs> you know, which is kind of, which is fun. Yeah, but yeah, it's- Yeah, super interesting. And then then they can also kind of see what, like what, what happens with the representations you learn. Like what's the ultimate downstream goal that we care about? And there they have something well defined there, right? Like in, in, in kind of abstract causal representation, I think that sometimes feels a little bit hollow that I, I didn't really know like, okay, why am I doing this? Um, but it, yeah, yeah, biology has an answer there and that's, that's really cool.